Good morning and welcome. Honored to have you here today. We're going to do something just a little different. If you see a songbook, of one of the blue songbooks by you, and you want to sing from the hymnal, grab it, turn to number 541. We're going to do several hymns that you requested today. Let's stand for the first couple of them, and then I'll let you be seated, all right? The Williamsons sang this song the first time they ever sang in church together, so let's sing it. There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. Turn to number 679. Bonnie Riddell, this when she was baptized at Holly Creek Free Will Baptist in Oklahoma, they sang this song at her baptism, okay? Shall we gather at the Dale Belcourt was in the Navy and stationed in Rota, Spain when he heard this song the day he got saved. And let's sing it. What's that? Do you all want to be seated or can you go through two more? Uh, uh, let's, let's try. Ready? Oh, wait, 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 wait. If you sing bass, you got to sing the bass on yes, the chorus. Yes, yes, yes. You have to sing the bass on the chorus. Well, nobody will go home until we sing the bass on the chorus. You got that? All right, here. All right, here we go. Ready? Wonderful grace on Jesus, greater than all my sin. How many 
of you have never heard that song before? Well, pay attention. We just got through singing it. <laughs> Be seated, please, and let's sing that last verse, all right? Here we go. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most we this song number 536 says it brings joy to our heart I have a song that Jesus gave me it was sent from heaven above there never was a sweeter melody is a melody of love in my heart there rings a melody It's not in your hymnal. This one is not in there. But this song was sung when pa Brother Patrick got saved. And we're going to try. It's the 70s. So if you're 70s and got bell bottoms on, you should be able to do this song. Okay. Oh, let the Son of God.
to number eight. This is Minnie Hodge's request. It's a reminder of God's consistence and unwavering love for us. And what a great song. Great is thy faithfulness. this next verse. Oh, what great words. Pardon for sin and a peace and endurance my own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow as many of you don't know or you do know, today we have a Pastor Appreciation Day. And uh, I, I could tell you stories of Pastor Howard and Matt and the things that they have done for us. I mean, I, I, I could go on and tell you the times that he, Pastor Howard drove, you know, to Sun City, you know, hour in some way, multiple times and days in a row to see my dad and to pray with him. I know Pastor Howard's gotten up at night, and just recently I, I got him out of bed. He was going to bed and dragged him out to the hospital, went and saw John, you know, he was in the ER. And, but they're willing to do that. Pastor Matt and Pastor Howard do so much for us, and I'm thankful. Jamie, would you come forward? Pastor Howard, you come up here, and Matt, I need you down here. And of course, we, uh, the church, you know, honors what you do, and we love you with all our hearts, and you've done so much for us that there's so little that, that we could do to express how much we appreciate for you. So the finance committee had got together, decided, well, we're going to give you a little gift. And, uh, you know, we just don't want you to spend it in the bar. That's all we're asking. <laughs> for. And, and, and I asked Jamie to come up. I wanted him to come and pray for the pastors for the church, if you would. Thank you. Lord, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts and we thank you so much for uh, our pastors and our staff and all the people that contribute so much to the work. Lord, we love you today, and we thank you for your blessings on our lives. Yes. And we know how fortunate we are and just how blessed we are yes. to, to have this church and all the people. And, Lord, I just uh, know that uh, today, as we recognize our pastors, Lord, it's our heart's desire that you just give them a great day. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. This will uh, pay down most of my tab. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, no. Thank you for being with here uh, with us here today. Uh, thank you for our online viewers as well. Uh, it's uh, 
good change to get to use some physical hymnals and uh, enjoying that for our hymn sing today. Please leave those. Uh, don't take those home with you. Uh, we're going to need those again for uh, when we do this next time. And uh, if you're uh, with us today, if you have anything to share inside your program, you have a connection card. If you're a visitor or if you want to, uh, anyone who wants to share a prayer request or updated info, anything. And we do have on the back these new style of cards. They got the little QR code, so you can scan that with your phone, and that will take you to give the digital version there to fill that out. So just drop those in the offering bag when we do that later after the next set of hymns. And Brother Jim and Sister Laura will be at the Welcome Center through the Double Doors, that if this is your first time with us today, please stop by there because they want to give you a gift to say thank you for being with us today. We do have a meeting for the security team in two Sundays on the 22nd, and uh, so everyone who's a part, the security members and the security assistants, uh, be uh, get some planning there, kind of looking at long-term stuff, how we can get some regular uh, firearm training, first aid training, everything we need. And uh, we have a tentative, uh, the Saturday after that, the 28th, a tentative uh, shooting range practice as well. So security members, keep track of that, please. And uh, you notice the table there in the front by the double doors. We have our Halloween gospel tracks. Try to do this every year. So uh, we just suggest to our families, you're going to have, uh, many of you will have trick-or-treaters that will come to your door. And so don't miss this chance to share the gospel with them. What we suggest is take a little baggie and put some pieces of candy in there and then pop in one of these gospel tracks and just prepare several of these baggies to give out. Uh, I know in my house we've had like 80 that came by last year. And so uh, just be ready for that. And then on the back of these, there's the church info on there. So if someone wants to make a decision for Christ or something, they've got our website, they can call us or anything. So this is just a way to try to share the gospel and uh, get our families involved and, and maybe try to reach your neighbors with uh, the good news of Jesus. We also have our picnic uh, coming up. That's going to be the first Sunday of November. So looking forward to that. There's sign-up lists on the tables on the side here uh, if you want to bring any specific item. Please let us know to plan for that, and uh, we'll have more details and directions with that as we get closer. And uh, the kids, we can head next door. That I'll be doing gospel magic show for the kids today, uh, our elementary kids, our preschool kids. And this is also if we have any kids at heart. So any of our adults who want to come over and watch the gospel magic show, you're welcome to do that as well. We're so glad that uh, you chose a variety of different kinds of uh, hymns and gospel songs. And we're going to sing one that Hank Williams wrote back a uh, hundred years ago, maybe. I want a bliss so filled with sin. I would let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Turn to number 444. This was written by Fanny Crosby. She was a blind lady and wrote thousands of hymns. This is one of her best. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation.
requested 213. Holy, holy, holy. Let's stand for this one, all right? turn to number 230. Most everybody knows this one, so we're going to do the first and last verses of Amazing Grace. This was written by John Newton. John Newton was a slave trader, 
and began and became a slave himself. And when he came to know Jesus, this was one of the songs that he wrote. last verse, Mary Carroll said that her mother used to sing this all the time. Even when she was on her deathbed, this was the last song her family sang to her. Jonathan Martinson learned the history of John Newton in elementary school and how he wrote this song. And Becky Peters says this was the song that spoke to me my whole life and it was played at her son's funeral. Let's sing this last verse together, all right? number 433 if you would sherry wilson lindsey mansfield and robert berg all three suggested this song in 1871 when the chicago fire destroyed much of that city w or horatio g spafford was an attorney that was heavily invested in real estate and he lost nearly everything and he helped the hundred thousand families that were displaced as a result of that fire. And then in November of 17, 1873, he decided to take his wife and his family to Europe. He had a son who had drowned. And as he went to Europe, something came up. He was going to hear D.L. Moody and Ira Sankey preach over in England. But an urgent matter came up. And so Mr. Spafford sent his wife and his daughters on the Vie de Harve, the ship as a luxury ocean liner. Sometime on the 22nd, the ship collided with another sailing vessel and began to sink. 226 people died, including all four of Horatio Spafford's children. Later, he went and made the voyage. And the captain told him this is where the Vieux du Harve went down. And he went back to his room and he penned these words to this song. And let's sing it together. When peace like a
our morning offering, Audrey Crosby will be playing for us. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you, God, for all that you've given us, for the care, for the health, for the homes, all your blessings, Lord, and we just pray that as we, in turn, return to you out of love, the small amount that we can do, that you would bless this offering, that we may build this church, that we may be a light in this community, that people might be brought closer to you. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Sister Audrey. I appreciate that so much. What a blessing. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. We'll be looking there in just a moment. Um, have any of you ever been robbed or burglarized at your home? Any of you? Oh, a bunch of us have. Um, man, that's sad. When we were in uh, Kansas City, our church was broken into 15 times in five years. And, uh, it, I mean, they, they stole office equipment and sound equipment and all kinds of stuff. But it, it makes you a little nervous. And I heard about this guy that got robbed at gunpoint on the street. And he, was, he found a police officer, and he, he goes up to the police officer. He was so nervous, and he said, Ossifer, Ossifer, I was siding on the stand walk singing on a great big smogar and up come a gun with a man in his hand and said, hand over your brains or I'll blow your money out. <laughs> Sometimes we have ushers that get a little nervous around here. And one of our nervous ushers said, Martin me, Padam, may I sew you to your sheet. <laughs> and then the, ner the nervous actor had two lines. It was his first time to have a speaking part in a play. What his lines were, were, I thought I heard a pistol shot. Who fired that shot? And so he worked on those lines and had them down. And then time for him, during the performance, to give his lines, he says, I thought I heard a shostel pot. I thought I heard a shistle pot. Who shired that thought? Oh, shoot, I'm fired. So... Not sure that really happened, but uh, anyway. Luke chapter 6, if you're able, please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 6 and verse 20. Before we pray, I want to remind you that uh, it's good to have Miss Carol, who's been in the hospital this week, but she's here today, Carol Pinkerton. Uh, John Till is still in the hospital and uh, Flora Finley is in the emergency room right now. So if you'd remember them when you pray. Uh, Luke chapter 6 and verse 20. Then he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And my iPad's blocked. Blessed are you who hunger for now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they persecute you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast your name as evil. For the Son of Man's sake, rejoice in that day, and leap for joy. For indeed your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich. For you who have received consolation, woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to false prophets. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts as we consider this passage of Scripture and others. And may it be a blessing to each of us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We talked last time about the fact that there are six kind of people here. There are the curious, maybe here that see what's going on. There are the coerced, maybe your husband or your wife or your mom and dad made you come. There are the critical, uh, there are some who are critical of everybody and everything. There are the concerned, there are at least some who are concerned about spiritual things. The convinced, they're convinced in their head but not in here. And then there are the committed, those who truly know the Word of God and have applied it to their lives and want to do their best to grow for Jesus. The Bible encourages us that this kind of living that we read about is kingdom living. We'll see it also in Matthew chapter 5 in just a moment. But you, all of us need to be content with what we have but never content with what we are. We want to be better tomorrow than we were today. 
we want to try to do better tomorrow. Now, how many of you ever make mistakes like me? Yeah. I, I you know, I... I do things that I shouldn't. I think things that I shouldn't. Sometimes I say things that I shouldn't say. And I have to, I have to repent about those things just like everybody else. And so it's important as we consider this, we're calling this the goat sermon, the greatest of all time. It was preached by Jesus. And, it, and we're going to look at it again in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 2. And notice it says, Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. As we look at these two passages, we compare them. There are some similarities and there are some differences. Last time we talked about the mountain where Jesus gave this message. We talked about the manner in which he spoke. We talked about the fact that he opened his mouth. He sat to teach, but he opened his mouth to teach. And then we talked about his message. They were the Beatitudes. So what are Beatitudes? They're attitudes you ought to be in. Right? There are things that we ought to have in our life to do this. Now, there were several different groups in Jesus' day who had their own beliefs about what was righteous and what was not, what to do and what not to do. And if you did the things that you were supposed to do and stayed away from the things that you weren't supposed to do, in their minds, they thought that that made you righteous. And we talked about the fact that I can prove that your dog is righteous. You know, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with girls that do and neither does my dog. Okay? But it's not what you do or don't do. It's that you know in your heart that you're a sinner, that you've repented of your sin and asked Jesus Christ to forgive you and save you. That's the point. We talked about these four groups. We talked about the zealots. They were an extreme political revolutionary group. The Sadducees were the theological liberals of the day. The Essenes were the separatists. They just withdrew from everybody. And the Pharisees were the legalists. Now, there are, we're going to talk about the Pharisees today because there are at least six kinds of Pharisees. First of all, there's the Shechemite Pharisee, those who keep the law for profit. And I won't take time to go into a lot of the detail, but you can find this in Genesis chapter 24 and verse 19, where Shechem was, had the rite of circumcision performed on him in order for him to marry Dinah. It was a bad thing, and you can check it out in Genesis chapter 24. But there are those who are the Shechemite Pharisees that do what they do in order to see how it's going to profit them. Secondly, there's the humbling Pharisee. He walks down with his head down. Do you all remember little Abner? Do you remember the guy that had the cloud over his I don't remember what his name was. Do you all, anybody remember that? But he walked around and he was all down in the dumps and he had this cloud over his head the whole time. And, and they, this was just the Pharisees. They had their heads down and they walked around and they were so humble. Everybody thought. Then there was the third one, are the bruised and bleeding Pharisees. You say, what is this? Well, they thought that to even look at another woman would be against the law of God, so they walked around with their eyes closed and they kept running into things. (laughs) That's why they were called the bruised and bleeding Pharisees. Then number four, there's the what must I do Pharisee. And we find this in Mark chapter 10. It's, it's the person who hears the law of God and say, okay, I've got that one checked off. Now what do I need to do next? 
Uh, could I say to you that it, it's not a matter of checking things off? Could, could I tell you, you could walk an aisle and kneel at an altar. You could be baptized, take communion, join every church in town and still die lost. Do you know that? Because it's not what you do. It's what He has done for you. And that's the difference. Then there's the fearful Pharisees, those who kept the law because of fear of future judgment. Now, I don't know about that, but uh, I was kind of that way with my dad. You know, if my dad told you not to do something and he found out that you did it, you were in trouble. I lipped off to a teacher when I was in uh, uh, junior high. I was seventh or eighth grade. And I, I got in trouble by Mr. Cawthron, and he was six foot six, big, tall, skinny guy, and uh, he got onto me for something I didn't do. And I mouthed back at him. So he took me to the office, and he had me bend over, and he had what was called the little green monster, and it was a paddle about that long, and he warmed me up about three times. Well, somehow, I don't know how this happened, but when I got home that night and my dad got home, he said, go to, go to the bedroom. And dad, you know, the worst sound in the world is a belt whipping through the belt loops, you know. And my dad had a belt six feet wide and 28 feet long and always beat us with the buckle end of it, you know, and he warmed up my southern hemisphere again. The fear of your dad. There are some people who fear God that way. That's not what the fear of the Lord is. We'll talk about that again. But then there's the loving Pharisee. There is the one who obeys the Lord because he loves him. Now, notice what Jesus said about the Pharisees in general. And I'm going to go through these real fast because I want to get to the end. Okay? And you're saying, yeah. I heard about the, the way to preach a sermon is have a good beginning and a good ending and make sure that in the middle is close together there, all right? So I'll try to keep that in mind. But Jesus said this about the Pharisees. He said that they were authorities of the Old Testament. In Matthew 23, 2, he says, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They were authorities on the Old Testament. They taught right living in verse 3 of that chapter. Therefore, whatever tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not according to their works, for they say and do not. In other words, Jesus has said they taught right living, but they don't live right. Have you ever heard the term practice what you preach? I've had that thrown in my face a few times. Have you? It's important that we learn to live, what, and let's face it, we all preach a better message than we live, unfortunately. We have a great, great message, amen? But we often preach a better message than we live. And Jesus said the Pharisees were like this, they taught right living, but don't do like they do. And then in verse 4, they challenge the people and stress that they are responsible to obey. Look at verse 4 of Matthew 23. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move with them one of their fingers. So they pile all of this stuff on the rest of us, but they won't lift a finger to do anything about it. You don't want to be like that, Jesus said. He also said they were respected leaders in their communities. In chapter 23 and verse 7, they loved the greetings in the marketplace and they loved to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi. But said, don't be like them because they just want the preeminence. Verse 14 says they prayed in public. Look at Matthew 23, 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers Therefore, you will receive the greater condemnation. So they liked to be seen in public, but they were devouring the widow's possessions for their own. Jesus said, don't be like that. Notice verse 15. They witnessed diligently. 
Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much the son of hell as yourselves. That's not the kind of person we want to be. And yet, they paid their tithes. Look at verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy, faith. These ought you to have done without leaving the others undone. In other words, down to the dill seed, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and one for you, Lord. And the anise leaves, one, two, three, and they went through that. They were meticulous about doing the little things, but Jesus said justice and mercy and faith are more important than the way you count out your tithes. Verse 25, they look good on the outside. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Now think about this. If you had somebody that looked good, and smelled good, and paid their tithes, and came to church regularly, and got baptized, and took communion, wouldn't you think that would be a great person? In our minds, that's what we think because that's all we can see. The only way that you and I can know whether each other is a believer is by how we live. But the truth is, you can't see my heart, and I can't see yours. Only God knows that. So with the Pharisees, everything was external. Some people, maybe even you sitting in this room today, think, God's really going to be proud of me because I went to Pastor Howard's church today. Listen, you could find a service nearly every hour of this day somewhere and you could attend all of them and God's not going to be impressed if you don't have a change of heart. That's the important thing. It's like the Pharisees. They were clean on the outside. They looked good. But Jesus said, on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. Throughout the scripture, you find two types of prophetic uh, announcements. There is blessing and cursing. And we find it in Matthew 23. Cursing means damnation, destruction, and doom. And it begins in these verses with the word W-O-E. Um, you remember? Um, do any of you remember Hee Haw? Yeah. <laughs> Gloom, despair, and agony on me. You remember, if it weren't for bad luck, I'd had no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony. Woe is that word that starts a curse in the verse. So eight times in verse 13, 14, 15, 16, 23, 25, 27, and 29, Jesus says curses on you. To the Pharisees. Woe or doom, destruction and damnation. Why? Because your system of beliefs will not save you. It profits you nothing to do all of these things and not have a right heart. The sad thing is that you and I tend to pattern after the Pharisees. You see, if we, if we check this box and this box and this box and we do this thing and this thing, we think that that somehow makes us righteous before God and it does not. You say, but pastor, this is a Baptist church, right? Yes. You baptize people here. Yes. You baptize to, to get them saved? No. You get baptized because you've been saved. Baptism is an outward sign of something that's happened on the inside of you. You can be baptized till you grow gills and all the tadpoles in the creek know your name and go to hell. Why? 
Because it's a matter of the heart, not what you do on the outside. What you do on the outside is not enough. The important thing is what you are on the inside. External law-keeping makes no one right with God. Look at Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Right out of the chute, Jesus says to each group, the Pharisees, the Essenes, the Sadducees, and the Zealots, all of you are wrong. Matthew 5, 20, For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And then number five. We want to talk to you about the God-man. As Luke recounts the story of Jesus and his life and ministry, he gives irrefutable evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, that He's God in human flesh and the Savior of the world. And nothing is more compelling than Jesus' teachings. And this greatest of all sermons, called the Sermon on the Mount or the Beatitudes, is what Jesus is saying. He gives the most truthful, wise, and powerful words in these passages that deal with this subject. Why? Because the people were astonished by what he said. Look in Matthew 7, 28. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. Why? For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. John 7, 35 says, When the officers came to the chief priest and the Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? The officer says, Never man spoke like this man. Boy, it's important what Jesus said because he was speaking truth to their hearts. Jesus spoke the truth because he had divine authority. He spoke about God as creator, about him being the king, about him being the father, about him being the sovereign ruler of the earth. He said God is holy and merciful and gracious. He's gracious even to unbelievers. Amen? He is perfectly righteous, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, and loving. Concerning himself, Jesus clearly declared his own deity and his absolute equality with the Father. And that was the reason that the Pharisees tried to kill him. Because he was making himself equal with God. Look at John 5, 18. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him. Because he not only broke the Sabbath but also said that God was his Father making himself equal with God. Listen, there is no question in the minds of the Pharisees that Jesus was claiming to be God. And it flew all over them. It angered them. Jesus said to the hostile Jewish leaders in John 8, 58, Most assuredly, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. He identified himself with the I am of the Old Testament. In John chapter 10, verse 30, he says, I and my Father are one. And the unbelieving Jews understood clearly that Jesus was claiming to be God. And that's why they were trying to kill him. Now, if they had misunderstood, if Jesus said something that they misunderstood, don't you think Jesus would have tried to clear that misunderstanding up? Certainly he would. Have you ever been misunderstood by someone? I have tinnitus really bad in my left ear. I have a ringing constantly, and I've lost about 65% or 75% of my hearing in my left ear. And you say, well, why don't you get hearing aids? I got them, and they don't help with everything. I met a guy yesterday. I thought he said his last name was Thomas. Thomas. And I started to say, well, my wife's maiden name was Thomas. She might be related to you and she might owe you money. So, and he said, no, it's Holmes. I don't know how I get this. So if you say something to me, I need to be looking at you and talking this ear. The right ear is the good one. Okay. So anyway, but there was no misunderstanding. Jesus was claiming to be God. John 19, 7. 
The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die. Why? Because he made himself the Son of God. And that claim is accurate. Jesus taught that he had come from heaven. He was sent by the Father to do the will of the Father. He claimed authority to forgive sins. And in fact, he claimed full power. All power is given unto me. All authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Matthew chapter 28. Now, there's four things that we need to keep in perspective. And I'll close with this. First of all, acknowledgement. When I say acknowledgement, I'm talking about what you know. I saw a guy's t-shirt the other, th- other day and it says, I know things and I fix stuff. Have you all seen that? It's, it's good to know things, isn't it? Uh, I, I don't know about you, but um, I have a diesel pickup. And you put diesel only in it. Only diesel. It does not mix with gasoline. And you put clean diesel in it, not dirty diesel. $6,000 to fix your dirty diesel engine. Anyway, it's good to, but I have no idea how to even start to repair a diesel pickup. But there are some guys, in fact, Bob Finley is one of them. He is a master craftsman when it comes to mechanical stuff. He knows how to do stuff. He, I mean, he may have never worked on anything, but he's going to find a way to fix it if he can. And he will. I mean, he's just that kind of guy. So it's good to know some things in order to be something in order to do something, right? So it's good to know. It's it's good to know how to tie your shoes, right? When Velcro came out on shoes, and our kids were little, changed our lives. <laughs> Amen. Velcro is a good thing, but it's good to know how to tie your shoes. And if you get to the place where you can't bend over and tie your shoes, buy slip-ons, right? (laughs) It's good to know how to drive a car. Even if you don't want to drive all the time, in an emergency, it would be good for you to know how to drive a car. It's good to know how to fix something to eat. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to know that. There are some things that are good, good to balance your checkbook. How to open a bank account. How to write checks and balance your check. It's important to know. But here's what the scripture says. In Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. What you know is important. But the most important thing you can know is the knowledge of God. That's the most important thing you can know. It's good to know spiritual things. It's good to know who God is, who Jesus is, why he came, why he died, why he was buried, why he, was, why he rose again. To know that there's forgiveness and pardon offered to you if you'll just ask him. That's good to know. And acknowledgement of those things, though, is not enough. It's not enough to know that up here. Acknowledgement is not enough. Then secondly, there are attitudes. What you are is revealed in your attitudes. If you have a right attitude, you can have right actions. If you've got a sorry attitude, you you may be like a clock that stopped. You could be right twice a day. Okay? Okay. But right attitudes will help you to produce right actions. Notice this verse. Oh, how how many of you have ever heard this? He makes me so mad. (laughs) Anybody ever said that? Yeah. Could I tell you something? 
he or she doesn't make you so mad. You got mad because you wanted to. Nobody held a gun to your head and said, hey, get mad, will you? No, you did that on your own. Right? I'm responsible for my attitude. Notice what the scripture says, Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Your attitude, what you think about, is going to come out. And you're at, you see, we're often guilty of what I call stinking thinking. Oh, yeah. That's right. We think the wrong thing and we do the wrong stuff. Yep. We think that we can get by with something and not suffer the consequences. But that doesn't happen. Now, let's go to the th third thing. There are actions. So acknowledgement is what you know in your head. Attitudes is what you know in your heart. Actions are what you do on the outside. And actions are a pretty good indicator of what's going on in someone's heart. But let me ask you, is it an infallible indicator? No. Because like I said, even a stop clock is right twice a day. But the truth of the matter is, can you always tell a person's attitude by his actions? No. John D. Rockefeller was a wealthy, rich, religious man. However, he was ruthless in his business activity. And, of course, even, you know, there was a big trial about him in Standard Oil Company. Uh, even though it, it got broken up into 30 different companies, John D. Rockefeller made billions. But he was a ruthless guy. And yet he read the Bible every night. Now, can you always tell... By a person's actions, if their attitude is right, no. The Pharisees did all the right stuff. Their outside was clean. They looked good. But inside, Jesus said, they're full of dead men's bones. See, your attitudes are revealed by your actions. If you can change what you are, then you can change what you do. Look at Luke 3, 8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. In other words, they thought their heritage was the thing that made them. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Instead, Jesus said, repent. Don't say that Abraham's your dad. That's meaningless. It doesn't matter who your dad or your grandfather or your great-grandfather is. Your dad may have been a deacon. Yeah, your grandfather may have been an evangelist or a pastor. What is your standing before God? And finally, the appropriation. The appropriation. You see, it's not enough to acknowledge in your head and have attitudes that are right, that produce actions, if you don't appropriate what you know. You say, what do you mean? You can know that Jesus died on the cross for you. You can know that he was buried and he rose again the third day. Up here. But it's got to reach in here. Amen. That's right. You can know it up here. But until it reaches in here, that's the difference. Right. A change of attitude would help a lot of people. Amen? Amen. I, I, have you known people who just sour all the time? <laughs> I had a an Uncle Orville, that I don't think I ever saw him smile. And he, he, we were staying around at his place one time, and in the middle of the night, you know, kids stay up late at night, but Uncle Orville comes out, and he's got a scowl on his face, and he says, Kids, will you hold this down? You're making so much noise, I can't even worry. <laughs> Just sour all the time. 
God deliver me from people like that. Amen? You know, I, I, I can put up with you for a little while, but if you're sour and down in the dumps all the time, I don't, I, you're toxic. What will change that? Coming to Jesus will change that. A change in attitude alone won't fix our problem. Changing your actions from bad actions to good actions is not enough. You must have a change of heart. Only Jesus Christ can do that. It was not enough to know that he lived a sinless life and died a vicarious death on the cross and that he was buried and rose again. You must appropriate it for you. What your parents or grandparents did is not enough for you. Do you know that God has no grandchildren? You're either his child or you're not his at all. And I close with this verse, 2 Corinthians 7.10. For godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Could I tell you? You ever been sorry you got caught? I think every one of us has been there one time. We're not sorry for what we did, but we're sorry we got caught. I think a lot of people are going to stand before God that way someday. They're going to be sorry they got caught. And here's the truth of the matter. All have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, not even one. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you would be saved. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not enough to know that up here. You have to know it in here. That's appropriation. There may be some of you sitting here today and you're thinking, I, I've never heard this before. You will not go to heaven because you're a good guy or because you're a nice lady or because you do good things. The only way any of us will go to heaven is by repenting of our sin and trusting Jesus to forgive us. That's the only way. You can join every church in town and die lost. You can be baptized and take communion and do all the, give all your money away. And still die and go to hell. But if you will say, dear God, I have broken your law. I deserve the death penalty. I ask you to forgive me of my sin and to cleanse my heart. I trust you to forgive me and take me to heaven when I die. The Bible says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful just to forgive you of sin and will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Could we stand for prayer? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. And while we've just begun looking at this greatest sermon of all time, you've heard the gospel and you've heard enough to be responsible before God. If you want to know Jesus as your Savior and you feel like you need help, we're happy to pray with you. That's why at the end of a service like this, we give an opportunity for folks to come forward and make a decision for Jesus. On the screen, there is a song that was requested by one of you. And we're going to sing it as an invitation hymn. But if God's dealing with your heart and you sense a need to come for prayer, we got folks ready to pray with you and help you to make things right between you and God. Let's sing it together, shall we? Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling Calling for you and for me See on the portals He's waiting for you and for me. 
thank you for being here. I trust the service has been a blessing to you. We're going to do the hymn sing again at the, on the fifth Sunday of the month. So we've got a fifth Sunday in October. So if you have requests, we didn't get to yours today. We'll try to get it next time. I think there is a, a couple of them that we couldn't find the music to. And, but we've found a couple of them that we're going to do next time. So if at the end of the month you got a song that you want to sing, um, let us know. We'll try to do that on uh, the 29th of this month. Thank you for being here. God bless you and thank you for... Brother Patrick, come on if you would. Let us pray. All wise, true, and ever-loving God. Lord, we humbly come before you this afternoon, O oh God, thanking you, O oh God, for this day. Thanking you for life. Thanking you for health. Thanking you for strength, O oh God. And Lord God, forgive us, O oh God, of our trespasses, knowingly and unknowingly. Look down upon your people, O oh God, as we cry out to you. Lord, we want to thank you for this ministry. We thank you for our pastors, Lord. Lord God, continue to touch them, continue to bless them and their family, O oh God. And keep us all, dear God. Lord, we just want to say thank you for every disciple in this house, those that are absent, those that are watching virtually. God, be with us, whatever our issues are, dear God. Lord, just a touch. Open the windows of heaven, dear God, and shower them with your complete blessing. And Lord God, as we leave from this place, I pray, dear God, we'll never leave from your presence, that we'll walk in the light. Our conversations will be pleasing to your ear. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, may the grace the love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Rest, remain, and abide with us all until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.